going to speak to you on the subject, near but not close. Near but not close. Elbow somebody and say, this is going to be good. Near but not close. We all know what it's like to be in proximity to someone but not feel close to them. Maybe you have a, a, a child or a teenager in your house that is, is roaming around the house and, and they're near to you, but you don't feel close to them. Or maybe you're, you're under the roof with a spouse that you feel near to, but not close to. Or you have a friend that, that, that maybe you get around and you're near to them, but you feel just a, a huge distance between you and them. That you're near, but not close. Close. I saw somebody on the side of the road getting pulled over by a police officer. The police officer walked over to the side of, of the window there, and they were near, <laughs> but not close. <laughs> the word that I'm, that, that I'm referring to is the word intimacy, to where you fully see someone, fully know someone, feel fully comfortable with someone, but more than that, you're really enjoying the relationship and the fellowship. You feel like there's no walls, there's no distances. And you know what? I, I've noticed, and I'm a, I'm a pastor. I, I'm with you guys all the time. I know many of your lives. I know many of your, your uh, life experiences. You can be near the Lord, but not close to the Lord. You can be up in the church, be near the things of God, but not be close to God not feel close to God, not talk to God, not, not spend time with him, not be with him. You can just be near him. And you know what the essence of religion is, especially Christian religion, is being near the things of God, his Bible, his people, his worship, his all of the stuff. Be near, but not close. Wave at me if you can identify with what I'm talking about. You can be near, but not close. So I'd like to use as a text for this morning, James chapter 4, and we're going to look more in detail at this text, but I'm just going to read one verse to get us started. James chapter 4 and verse 5 says, or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? One more time, I'll read it. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. God is jealous over you. He desires you like a, like a husband would be jealous over a wife. God feels that level of intense longing to be close to you. God doesn't just want to be near to you. He wants the walls down. He wants fellowship. He wants closeness. And so let's pray. Holy Spirit, I pray that you breathe upon the words that are being spoken today. And Lord, draw us close to you. Draw us near to you. Lord, we don't want any walls between us. We don't want any shadows. We don't want any shame. We don't want anything keeping us, Lord, from a close walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to start off by just saying that here's a couple of facts we know about proximity to God. The first fact that we know is this. God desires us. This is an important thing because you're not just one of God's 8 billion humans that he doesn't care about. Yeah, there are 8 billion of them. It doesn't matter. God actually knows your name. He knows the, the number of hair that are on your head. You've heard it. Some people, that some, for some people, that's easier than others, right? <laughs> but God has counted the, the, the hairs on your head. God knows your thoughts. He knows your words. He knows the little small details of your life. He knows the small prayers. He knows the big prayers. And he desires to be close to us. The Bible says in Revelation that it was for his pleasure that we are created. God desires us. And it's not a passive desire. It's a jealous yearning. He's not just like, well, whatever. No, he, he's, in, he's invested in being close to you. And he's actually done so much to be able to tear down walls and move things out the way. I mean, to the extent of sending his own son to die on a cross so he could tear down some walls to be close to you. So you have to know this, that wherever, however you sit today, maybe you feel near to God but not close to God, know that God desires to be close to you. It's not his desire to be far away. So that whatever distance that is, just know it's not supposed to be there. God desires us. The second fact that we know is this, he's already near. 
We know that he's omnipresent. And David said this in, uh, in the Psalms that if I, if I go to heaven, you're there. If I go to hell, you're there. Wherever I am, you're there. But do you know that God is literally omnipresent in every place in this known universe? And just to kind of bring that to scale, I want to show you an image uh, that was produced by NASA, okay? This, uh, NASA produced this image. So what this is, is their best knowledge of the known universe, okay? I don't think we can even fathom how huge what's out there is. We are specks of dust on a speck of dust in a speck of dust in a cone of the universe. It's insane how small we are. This is the known universe, and I want you to see this little bitty square there that looks like a, I don't know, looks like something from Star Wars. What that is measuring is one billion light years. If you traveled for a billion years at the speed of light, that's how far you've gone across the known universe. At the bottom there is 93 billion light years travel, 93 billion years, and that's just as far as we know is out there. But to know that if you were on one corner, God would be right here. And if you're on the other corner, he's right here. And no matter where you are sitting right here in this room, he's right here. He's not God way, way up there. He's God right here. He's and, and when you lose that loved one, he's right here. When you walk through tragedy and hell and, and, and all kinds of things, he's right here. You don't have to say, where is God? No, he is right here. He's right here. So he desires us. He's already around us. And here's another fact that we know is that if we seek him, we will find him. We play a game at my house called Wolf, and it's a fancy version of hide and go seek. And whoever is hiding, dad, is the wolf. And, and the reason why we call it wolf is because when we're not found, we'll, we'll howl like a wolf. Oh! And so they kind of know where to look for, okay? But when my kids were young, they could never find me, ever. It doesn't matter how much I, oh, they can never find me. So they said, Dad, you got to hide easier. <laughs> hide easier. So, so I would hide a little bit easier. But we developed a scale, 1 to 10. If Dad hides a 10, it literally is impossible to find me. You, you will not find me. They're like, Dad, hide a 6. And still couldn't find me. They said, Dad, hide a 3. Still couldn't find me. So I had to figure out how to put it on a 1. And you know what a one was is I'm, by, I'm behind the curtain, my head's sticking out, my shoe's hanging out a little bit, and I'm, oh, you know, they come out, and they find, we got you, we found you. And I was like, yeah, because I'm not hiding too hard. I'm hiding to be found. God's not hiding a 10. He's hiding a one. And the promise of the word is if you seek him, you will find him. I curated a few verses that I want to just read because when we read the, the, the scriptures, it brings such encouragement to our, to our spirits. But this is promises from the word of God. I'm just going to read through these, and I want, want them to minister to you. Look up on the screen as I read Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Jeremiah 29, verse 13 says, If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and will bring you home again to your own land. Deuteronomy 4, verse 29. But from, where, but from there you will search again for the Lord your God, and if you search for him with all your heart and soul, you will find him. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 17. I love all who love me. Those who search will surely find me. Psalm 145, verse 18. The Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. And it's woven through all, all of scripture that if we will just seek the Lord, we will find him. Isn't that encouraging? I just want you all to look at me for a moment. Wherever you are with the Lord right now, if you'll just seek him, 
you will find him. And I know throughout the room there are some people that enjoy close fellowship with the Lord, but there are many Christians who are near but not close. And if you'll just seek the Lord, you will find him. So this is the facts that we know. So now let's talk about the problems. What are the problems that stand in our way? Well, the first problem is this. We are independent. Can I get a witness? Do you know what it means to be uh, independent? It means that you're self-reliant, self-sufficient. And here's the, here's the way to say it, is you're satisfied without being close. You're satisfied without. You wish it were, but you're satisfied without. And that, in essence, is what independence is. Is that I'm okay, Lord, without being close to you. I'm okay, Lord, just continuing to go through my life without hearing your voice, without walking with you, without talking to you. I'm okay without. And this is the human condition, is an independence, a self-reliance. And we've got to address that self-reliance because if you're going to be close to the Lord, you have to humble yourself and admit your need for him. And this was Eve's problem. Many don't know in the, in the garden, it says the knowledge of good and evil. She literally was oblivious to the knowledge of good and evil. She did not know the difference between good and evil and evil. And the Lord says, I will carry that burden because if you start trying to figure out what is good and evil, you are going to fail. Only I can handle that. So trust me. But her independence said, I'd like to do that too. I would like to have that power to know the difference between good and evil. And that independence drove her to that first step that began the separation with God. So we have to address this independence where we're okay not being close to God. The second problem that we have is we pursue other things. We want God, but we also want money. We want God, but we also want comfort. We want God, but we also want pleasure. We want God, but we want all kinds of other things. God is all throughout scripture referred to like a husband who doesn't want us, his spouse that he's betrothed to, to have other lovers. Just like a husband would not tolerate that in a marriage. God says, I will be first. But man, we pursue so many other things and this is why Jesus said, you can't pursue me and money. You can't have two masters. You have to choose. The third problem that we have is that we feel ashamed. And man, if I could just really focus on one the most, it would be this one. Is after Adam and Eve had done what God told them not to do, they felt naked and they went and hid. And the Lord had to come looking for them. And, and it just shows that God wants to be with us. He came looking for Adam. He said, Adam, where are you? And he says, I was afraid and I hid. And the Lord said, who told you that you were naked? But he felt his shame and he felt his nakedness. And this is the human condition, is that we're imperfect. We think imperfect thoughts. We say imperfect things. We do imperfect things. And man, shame is not a passive force. It is an aggressive force. The Bible calls it the accuser of the brethren, the one who would say, hey, you don't deserve to call on the name of the Lord. You don't deserve to come into his presence. You, don't, you haven't been doing good. You haven't been uh, living up to what you need to live up to, so you shouldn't pursue God. That's what shame says. But thank God that he covers us in the blood of Jesus and that our imperfections are covered through Jesus Christ. And so we have this, this knowledge that God desires to be close to us, that he's already with us, and that if we seek him, we'll find him. But we have also these issues that our shame is separating. So what is the solution? And with that, I want to read the rest of the passage in James. And, and I'm going to start from verse 4. It says, guys, I will tell you, James is, is pretty cutthroat right here. He's, he's just saying it like it is, right? But James, we can handle it, brother. We can handle it. Give it to us. He says this, you adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate, that the spirit 
he has placed within us should be faithful to him. He gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. The Lord desires our hearts. The Lord desires to walk with us to be close to us, not just near, but to be close. So here's our solutions. Number one is we're gonna change our hearts. Boy, that's a hard one to do. We need his help to do that. What does that mean? That means to change the passions of your heart. And here's my question right now. What are you most passionate about right now? What are you most passionate about? Say, how can I figure that out? What do you Google all the time? What bookmarks are in your Instagram? What do you talk about all the time? This is what you're passionate about. And you know, God wants to be that. God wants to have the premier passion of your heart. So to change your heart means to dethrone some things. Some things that are exalted above him. I just say, you got to take second place. Push some things down in your passion. So we change our hearts. The second thing that we're going to do is cleanse our ways. You know, if you refuse to stop doing things that you know displease God, you're going to be perpetually battling that sense of shame. So once you change your heart, you have to cleanse your ways. This just means sanctifying your lifestyle to where you're not listening to, watching, consuming, doing things that are unpleasing to the Lord. I'll illustrate it like this. If I had a a pet in my lap and I'm going to choose a dog instead of a cat because I'd never be close to a cat. (laughs) Oh, I I could go in right here, but I'll just go. I know I have some cat lovers in the, in the house, so I'm going to take it easy. I will say all dogs go to heaven. I'm not saying anything about any other species. I'm just saying dogs go to heaven. No, I'm just playing. But if I had that pet on my lap, I can be near that pet, but there's a certain degree that I'll never be close to that pet. My wife can be in the other room, and although the the dog is near, I'm closer to her because we are close to that with which we are similar. I don't have a lot in common with the dog, but with my wife, we know each other, and there's that intimacy. And the same with God, the more we become like him, the closer we are to him. That's why Jesus said, Be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. The more like him you are, the more you'll agree with him, the more you'll think like him, the more you'll you'll line your life up. You used to think a certain way, but it's changed, and you agree with your Father. You're not ashamed of things because your life is clean. So here's the exhortation. Stop doing things that separate you from God. Come out of sin. Whatever it is that is producing that shame and guilt in your life, you got to get rid of it and you got to stand above it. You got to rise above it. You got to get strengthened by your brothers and sisters in Christ and become who the Lord desires you to be. The final thing that we're going to do is we're going to chase after Him. We're going to passionately pursue Him because the scriptures tell us that if we seek Him, we will find Him. What does it mean to seek the Lord? I believe that in God's ideal scenario with one of us, he desires to have an ongoing communion with us inside of our hearts, which means we're walking every day with him. 
We're hearing his voice whisper to our hearts. We're saying the things he tells us to say. We're going where he tells us to go. We're walking in stride with him. But in order for us to get to that place, we have to pursue. We have to chase after him. And he's hiding a one. I think what this looks like is Monday morning, you taking time and alone with the Lord, saying, God, I'm here. I surrender to you. Speak to my heart. You know, when I dated Angie uh, two decades ago, you know, guys, we celebrate 20 years of marriage, our next anniversary. That's a big deal. But when I dated her, she was working at J. Alexander's, and she was the hostess at J. Alexander's. And I would go and visit her. And you know, it's not a good thing for boyfriends to visit their girlfriend on the job. <laughs> but I would miss her and I'd want to go there. So I'd go and get a table. I need a table for one, you know, and go sit over in the corner. And every time she'd walk past and look over there at me, I'd wink at her. <laughs> I'd like to say I only stayed 20 minutes, but I would stay three hours. <laughs> and I know you say, oh, well, that's kind of creepy. Well, I married her. Whatever I did worked. <laughs> but there is a pursuit of something that you love. And I feel like the Lord is saying, asking you, will you pursue me in that way? Will you chase after me in that way? Will you carve out time in your mornings and, 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 and seek after me? Will you be still? Hey, let me just encourage you with one prayer that you should pray every day. You should be still before the Lord and just say, Lord, I give you this day. I want to walk throughout this day with you. I want to hear your voice. I, I want to obey you. I want to be with you. And you just be still for a few moments and let him know that you are his priority, that, that you are seeking after him. And you watch how he'll begin to walk closer and closer and closer because I don't believe it is our destiny to be near but not close. I believe that we're supposed to be close to him. Amen.